Okay, let's pray and we get started. Father, we thank you for this day. Thank you for the opportunity to get together and learn. And Father, we pray for the ministry of the Holy Spirit. We pray, pray for truth uh, and understanding to be imparted to each of us. And may we continue to learn, may we continue to grow and be equipped to serve you and to serve your people well. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Okay, any questions from yesterday about um, how the Bible came to us and why do we have so many different English versions of the Bible? Like, what is the difference? Any questions? Uh, is it clear why we have uh, we were, uh, just like thinking uh, of this, uh, the chapters and verses. One minute, we can't hear you. Hear your audio. Speaking. Um, is my audio okay? On online students, okay. Um, I don't know if your audio is. Um, okay, okay. Um, Okay. So in the uh, uh, earlier scroll, when we had to scroll, there was no chapter and verses. Yes, yes. Those days. But on what basis they have uh, uh, separated those chapters and verses? Like, oh, how was that okay. Mentioned? Yeah. So on what basis did they? So it was just, uh, let, uh, let's say, like logical, um, logical literary style, you know, so where they felt that, where they felt that, the writer had concluded a certain thought or starting a new thought, make a new chapter and uh, reference a verse. Uh, and then in some Bibles, they also give headings to, you know, various sections and all that. But those are all human made, right? It wasn't there by the original writer. So the introduction of chapter and verse was purely human. Uh, based on what is logically the writer's thing, or the thought, where a thought ends, where a new thought starts. And uh, in some Bibles where they put those headings and all that, all that is, uh, it can be ignored or it's just to help us. That's all. Yeah. Sela, uh, pause and think. Ah. Okay, that is written by in some scriptures and some it is not. So that is also like man made or just like. Oh, Sela, I think it is in the original text. Where the writer says, the psalmist says, pause and ponder on this. So you'll find that in the King James, New King James. Uh, some texts may, uh, I don't know why they drop it out, but I think it's in the original text. Yeah. Yeah. It was originally intended by the writer, the psalmist, for the people to pause and think. So that is like part of the text. Uh, any other questions? All right. Um, Andrew, you have a question here online? Pastor, I have written a message. Oh, okay. Oh. Oh, why the Bible isn't arranged properly like the book of Job? Oh, that's an interesting question. Why isn't it arranged chronologically exactly like the book of job is the oldest book and why it's not in the beginning uh, i think the arrangement actually it started off in the old testament uh, the arrangement was done uh, according to what they categorized uh, to different sections the first uh, few books are uh, the first five books are the books of moses which is from the origin to the coming of the law. Uh, then there is history, then there is poetry, then there is uh, wisdom, uh, which would be Proverbs and Ecclesiastes. Then there, there is the uh, major prophets and then the minor prophets. So the books of the Bible are not arranged chronologically, but they are arranged according to these sections. The way the uh, Jews looked at uh, the whole set of 39 books. So they looked at it as uh, the books of Moses, the law, history, 
which is all about you know from right from uh, uh, Joshua on till I think till the end of um, Ezra, then poetry, uh, which is uh, mainly Job, Psalms, and uh, wisdom, and major prophets, minor prophets. So it's been arranged that way. Uh, yeah, so which is different from what we would normally think of putting a book chronologically in that order. Yeah, so that's the difference. Uh, New Testament, uh, again, it's the Gospels. So they were all written at different periods of time, uh, but it's been put together. Okay, the, you know, it's pretty in, in obvious in the sense of the, uh, the Gospels, which are all the accounts of the life and the earthly ministry of Jesus, uh, then the birth of the early church, then mainly the epistles, which are the writings to the believers, the pastoral epistles, and then that kind of brings us to the uh, uh, the final uh, book of Revelation and so on, Jude and Revelation. Again, these are not chronologically assembled. That means they're not put together in the date in which they were written. Uh, we know that First John, First, Second, Third John, and Revelation were written last, but the gospel. So, if you look at how the New Testament was written, the book of James was written first. Um, then Paul's, you know, Paul's epistles came in after that, and then uh, towards the end, then came the gospels, and then came, you know, uh, Revelation, and so on. So, even the New Testament is not chronological, but it's more in terms of the sections, relevant sections, their position like that. Yeah. Yeah, you have a question? Sir, uh, uh, commentary, what commentary we should use for? Bible commentary. Ah, okay. I will share now. Uh, I'll just share now. Uh, okay. Only thing is, those of you in class cannot see my computer. I was going to share my screen. Um, yeah, so yesterday, okay, so here's what I wanted to share. Um, so we saw on yesterday on page, uh, in our notes, on page 56, um, the fact that there are so many uh, versions of the Bible, uh, English, I'm talking about the English Bible, and I'm sure even, uh, you know, maybe in other languages, there could be more than one uh, translation or version. So we saw for in English, there's this whole range of English Bibles. So how can we make the best use of them? How can you make the best use of it? So what, this is my suggestion. I'm not saying this is like Bible or anything. This is my suggestion. Uh, especially if we want to study the Bible well and then preach and teach it well, right? So what I would suggest is when you're studying the Bible, use a, 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 a Bible, use a Bible that is close to the original, like a word-for-word -word translation, right? So that's why I, 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 I used to use King James Version. When I first started reading Bible, I started with the King James. Then I moved to the New King James. So it is quite close to the word for word. Now, there are other versions, like if you, some people prefer NASB or uh, Amplified or uh, ESV, RSV, which are all close to the original for Bible study. And that is good. So use a Bible that is very close to the original, right? And when you are studying the Bible, try to look up the Hebrew or the Greek words, right? So how do you do that? So for that, I use uh, Eastwood. I use the tool, right? So if I just share on my, oh, I wish, um, I wish we had a projector so I could show it to you. Anyway, so for that, I use, let me share my screen. E sort, dismiss. <laughs> yeah, so for that, I use um, E sword. Right, um, where uh, in 
New King James or, or, the, or, the, or the King James Bible, you can look up the Hebrew words, right? So uh, I, I use uh, I use uh, in, on uh, in New King James uh, in sorry in East Word, you can look up the Hebrew and the Greek words, right? And uh, I also use dictionaries, right? So uh, there is uh, like there would be the Thayer Dictionary, a few few of them uh, are free dictionaries. Uh, and some are paid, the Wines Old Testament, Wines New Testament. So if I want to see the meaning of a word, I look up the Strong's word, right? And also uh, I see, okay, what is the meaning of that word? So in, in, in a dictionary, right? So that way I'm, I'm starting with New King James, plus I'm looking up the meaning of the Hebrew word or the Greek word using this tool. So. And, and I see the meaning in different dictionaries. So you get a good understanding of what is written originally. Hey. So you start like that. So then you know, oh, this word. And sometimes uh, you will see that because in English we have limitation. Example, the Greek word could have three or four meanings. But in English, they may have only put one meaning. The sentence is still correct, but it's not capturing everything which the writer may have had. It's not capturing everything. So when you look up the Hebrew or the Greek word, you'll say, oh, the word actually means like this. Or the dictionaries will give you um, an example of how that, what that word meant in those times. So, exa you know, example is Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. In, in English, it says, now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Substance. is it, What is the substance English word? Then you look up the Greek word. Oh, it's like foundation. Faith is the foundation. So when they, that, that word substance in English, Greek, he's talking, it's like a solid foundation. They use that word to talk about foundation. And it also, uh, the word evidence, I think it means title deed, proof of ownership. Oh, sorry, it's a, maybe it's the first word. I should look it up now. Um, so, uh, Hebrew Islam, word substance. So, when I say who you post us, yeah. So, when you look at the meaning of that word substance, yeah, substance, it is a support, foundation. And of course, it's translated assurance and when you say the word evidence proof test um, pr proof or we say a certain persuasion they proof something that's approved where's the sub word I think it's substance that okay they uh, so substance, foundation, uh, steadfastness, confidence, um, confident person, assurance. Okay. So yeah. So the word subs uh, substance. The word substance. Uh, it's also an engagement on taking with regard to the conduct of others or vouching. So it's like uh, a vouching uh, substructure. So it has two meanings. It is a uh, foundation. It is also, um, I think this particular word also means uh, title deed. So where did I get that? And where do you see it? Um, okay, I'm just trying to see. I think that is brought out in the Amplified Bible, that word substance. Okay, um, a pledged prof profession and uh, essence, substance. Let me just give me a minute. Let me do a search here. Yeah. 
confidence, assurance, and uh, yeah, let me check up the word evidence. So this is in the Wines translation, right? So we're looking at it in the Wines translation. Um, evidence is not there. C D. Okay. All right. Um, just give me a moment. Let me look it up. Maybe it's also in the Amplified Bible. Hebrews eleven one Amplified. Okay, so it's in the Amplified Bible, right? So the Amplified Bible brings out the meaning. It says Hebrews eleven one. Now faith is the assurance, the confirmation, the title deed of things hoped for. Okay, so let me just go back to Eastward, uh, and I'll share with you. Like so, when we are studying the Bible, uh, it's always good to uh, use a tool, like I was just sharing about Eastward, where. You could look up the the word, the Greek word. You see what it says in different dictionaries. So evidence is telling us that word substance. If you look up the Greek, it's telling us assurance, confidence, foundation. And then you also look it up in other versions of the Bible. So that, that particular verse, so you can look it up in other versions. So when you look it up in Amplified, it puts in brackets, assurance, confidence, title deed. So now you're getting an additional understanding. Title deed means uh, proof of ownership. Like you have the piece of paper that you own this thing, right? So now you're getting um, to understand different uh, meanings of that one word, right? It is. It means foundation, something very solid. You cannot shake it. Uh, it means having assurance. It also means having proof of ownership. So you can say faith is the title deed, is a proof of ownership. So, uh, uh, so that's the advantage of having these many other versions, right? You look up one verse. Of course, you study it in the dictionary. Look at it up in dictionary. You look at other versions, and you see like, oh, they bring it, uh, bring out other meanings of that word, which they would have studied, like because they are Greek scholars or their Hebrew scholars, they would have studied. So they bring out that meaning. And so you get a full meaning of that particular verse. Then you can also look up, uh, read some commentaries. right? Now, the problem with commentaries are, there's so many commentaries. And commentaries are basically the author or a group of writers. They're you know, their views or their thoughts on particular scripture. And obviously, uh, the writers will come from their background. You know, so if you read a commentary written by somebody who's purely from an evangelical background, then you'll see that thing throughout the commentary. So I would recommend using commentaries that are written by spirit-filled writers i mean those who believe in the work of the holy spirit the baptism of the holy spirit uh, the gifts of the spirit and so on you can definitely read commentaries by other people but then keep in mind they are going to be bringing their perspective on it and there's nothing, nothing wrong it's their perspective uh, as long as you know where you stand on certain things right otherwise you can be fully confused because different commentaries will have different perspectives of the individual writers and it's, it can be very confusing. So I usually limit myself. Uh, one is David Guzik. He is a spirit-filled. So he actually, David Guzik, as a Bible teacher, he came out of the, I mean, he's, he was part of the uh, Calvary Chapel. So that was a spirit-filled movement back in, starting from the 1970s on, uh, those churches. So he's a spirit-filled writer. right? So his commentary is something I would recommend. And the nice thing he does is he quotes from many other authors. That means he has already already done a lot of study for you and me, right? He, he has already read 
many other commentaries and he will quote now and then he'll say okay so and so says this so and so so you actually get to see what other people have said he'll give the views uh it's up to you to decide but he just says so and so said like this about this verse so he puts that in so it's it's basically he's done a lot of work for you so it's useful that way and um, when he puts his own thoughts they all, all obviously come from spirit filled thing uh, Chuck Smith was like a predecessor to David Guzik, so he also has his commentary. But it's a little, uh, it's not like a very scholarly work, it's more of a preacher work. Chuck Smith was a good preacher. So that, uh, Finnis Dake, Dake's Bible. So that's uh, Dake's Bible, and there's also the Spirit Filled Study Bible. So the Spirit Filled Study Bible was written by a group of Spirit Filled authors, uh, writers. So it's a collection. So they that Bible also is a good study Bible. They have a lot of commentary. And it's from a spiritual perspective. Uh, but David Guzik's commentary is free. So you can you know uh, use that. But if you want to buy something like a Dake's Bible or a spiritual Bi Bible, you can buy it. Uh, and those are spiritual writers. Right? Um, they're good. Um, yeah, then apart from them, I don't read too many other commentaries because it's 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 a lot, and uh, you can't read everybody's commentary. And so. Bible Hub. Uh. Uh, yeah, so that's useful. Yeah, all those things. Yeah, so that's a, that's a useful thing, right? So, uh, and that's something I do, but I do it within Eastwood, where uh, uh, for one verse. You can see in one screen all the versions. So I just quickly check that. And I quickly read it. So it helps you that you can quickly read uh, many verses. So if I, so Hebrews 11, 1, I select the verse. And I, I say compare. Then I can see that same verse in uh, different English uh, versions. I can just read it. Also the original Greek. If I want to read in Hindi, also I can read. and. Uh, all that so it's useful right Isor, i i think phone is a paid version i think uh the, this um, windows is a free version yeah but i think phone I, I never tried it on the phone i think there's a paid version yeah but anyway so what i wanted to get across was um what i wanted to get across was um we can take advantage of many different versions of the Bible in our Bible study, right? So you start with a version that's close to the original text, look up the original Hebrew and Greek words, look up their meaning, it's using dictionary. Uh, read that same verse, you read it in different versions very quickly, like nowadays you can read it online. See, so when you read different versions, you get a better understanding of that same verse. and then after that, if you want to look up some commentaries, you can look up. Okay, so that way you get a good understanding of that verse or that passage. Then, when you're preaching and teaching, you can do it with confidence because you've done your study. You know exactly. Okay, this is what the verse actually means. What I'm saying is correct because I've studied. I've looked up the Hebrew, the Greek. I've looked up the dictionary. I've seen it in many other versions. I've also read, you know, any commentaries on read. So I know what I'm saying is correct. I've studied the full thing. So it gives you confidence that you can say that, you can preach that uh, correctly, right? OK. All right, now, Diksha. Diksha, you're online. OK. Uh, was Job before the flood or after the flood? Noah's flood. Noah's flood. Uh, I have to look it up, but I think it was before Noah's flood. Before Noah. But I'll look up and tell you. Okay. But I think it was before Noah's flood. I I am not 100 percent sure. Okay. Any other questions? All right. Let's finish this chapter and then we will move to another topic. Um
Yeah. So we can use these, having different versions of the Bible, use it to your advantage in your Bible study, and it helps. And uh, yeah, reading some of the modern versions uh, um, will also help you communicate in simple language uh, the meaning of that verse. All right. So in closing, uh, we just uh, want to emphasize uh, the Bible is an amazing book. Uh, some of the things that make it really stand out is uh, I'm on page 57. It's unity. So though it was written over 1,500 years, 40 different writers, uh, 66 books, uh, there is unity in what it says about God. Right? Of course, the picture of God, the understanding of God is, you know, is given. Uh, you know, and, and you get a beautiful picture of who God is, why he created the universe, and so on. Secondly, uh, historical and archaeological accuracy. So it's not like a uh, fiction, it's not like a legend just or a fable, but it's accurate. So the events that the Bible talks about actually happened. Right? It's not some story. Uh, the places it talks about, um, they are all there. You know? And so as archaeologists keep discovering more and more places, and just saying, ah, oh, Bible, it was stated. You know, so it's, it's, uh, you know that this is not just a fable, not just some story somebody's written, right? Um, uh, number three is uh, fulfilled prophecy, right? Um, there are so many prophecies, various things about Christ coming, about uh, his death, but his resurrection, his life. So it's amazing that we can read the Old Testament. And we can see in the New Testament those prophecies being fulfilled. It's amazing, right? So, and then we can see prophecies concerning the end times, concerning the future. So the Bible is an amazing book because it tells us about our beginning and also tells us about our future. It's not like we don't know where we came from, we don't know where we are going. <laughs> it's not like that. It's like this is where we came from, this is where we are going, and this is the meaning of life. This is how you're supposed to live. This is why Jesus came. Right? So it answers all of those questions. And number four, it's indestructibility. Like people have tried to destroy the Bible, but it's the greatest book. You know, it's, it's all over the world. So many languages, just everywhere. So nobody's been able to destroy it. Cannot be. Uh, it's, cent it's centered about Jesus. It's pointing to the person of Jesus. Uh, number six, his teachings are powerful. Um, uh, even though people may say, hey, this book is such an old book, almost 2,000 years old, one more, how it can be relevant to us today. Read it. The things that were written even in the Old Testament, the Proverbs, all those things have lessons for us today, right? Meaning for us today, and the teachings of Jesus. So uh, it's timeless, and it 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 is life transforming, right? So people's lives are changed by just reading the Bible, right? So it's an amazing book, right? Uh, there's just a little. Um, Note there that's taken from the Gideon's Bible. It's, it's very nice. You can read that. All right. So let's go to lesson number 10. Now we are changing a little bit. The next uh, two or three lessons are about the person of Jesus Christ. So one question is about the Bible. You know, why you say Bible is true? Why you say you can depend on the Bible? Why you say Bible is correct, etc.? We, we should be able to answer. Another set of questions people ask is about Jesus himself. Why do you say Jesus is the only way? Why can't we say there are many roads that go to Rome? It is true, many roads go to Rome, but only one road goes to heaven. <laughs> yeah. You can come to Bangalore in many ways, to heaven only one way. <laughs> Just because people say many roads go to Rome, doesn't mean you can take that same thing and say many roads go to heaven. It's not true. So people ask the question, 
why do you why do you christians why do you people say jesus is the only way so we have to give a good answer and we of course we have to be convinced ourselves why we say jesus is the only way we have to be convinced and then we have to give a good answer to people why we say jesus is the only way right and uh, and then another lesson we want to cover is about the resurrection of Jesus. How can you say Jesus rose up from the dead? Because none of us were there. We didn't see physically him rising. Here we are 2,000 years later. We are saying Jesus Christ rose up from the dead. How can we be convinced? And how can we tell somebody, look, this is why we are saying Jesus rose up from the dead. So that is another question. And that also, especially for Muslims, because they say, no, no, Jesus, they agree Jesus was a prophet. They agree he was there. They don't question that. But they'll question his death and resurrection. How you can say Jesus rose up from the dead? So we have to be very clear, right? The uniqueness of Jesus, we have to especially. I explain that to the Hindu because in Hinduism any number of gods okay we can add one more <laughs> it's okay doesn't matter so if you say Jesus is God okay one more but if you say Jesus is the only God then how oh. So for the Hindu person, for the Hindu faith, this is important. To say why we are saying Jesus is unique, only, only way. For the Muslim, why you say Jesus rose up from the dead? How can you say that? So these, these two things, are, then so we will cover both of them. So lesson number 10. Why do we say Jesus is unique? Right? So now, historically, uh, the fact that Jesus lived and died and was crucified is historical fact. We cannot question the that Jesus lived there because history about nineteen different uh, ancient sources mentioned. There was a person called Jesus. He was crucified. Some of them say exactly he was crucified. Some of them even say okay. Uh, there was this news about his resurrection. So, historical books or historical writings record about the person of Jesus. So, he was there. It's not a story, it's not a fable. Right? And some, we mentioned some of them here. Uh, uh, Roman and these are not just Jewish historians; they're Roman historians. That means they were from the Roman Empire. They recorded that uh, there was this Jesus who uh, uh, lived and so on. So from that time period, there are many of them. We have given a list of uh, hist Roman historians, and there are also Jewish historians who have recorded. And then, of course, there are the uh, Christian writings the Gospels, written by his followers. Of course, then people say that is a little biased. His own followers wrote it. But that is also a record, a detailed record of his life and his ministry, his death and resurrection. So the Gospels are there. And there are there is archaeological findings uh, or evidence of all the places mentioned in the Gospel. So it's not like they're simply making these stories up. No. The places mentioned in the Gospels are actually there. That these are the places Jesus went. So it was not made up. right? Uh, and so you cannot say Jesus never existed or his life is all a that's, it's just made up story. That's there. So the question now is, why do we say Jesus is absolutely unique? Right? So we, we will mention these nine things. Bottom of page 61 and top of page 62. Right? And we'll go through these. First of all, Christ's claim for himself. What did Jesus say about himself? 
He didn't say, I am a good teacher, I will teach you. He didn't say, I will give you some philosophy. He didn't say, I will show you art of living, art of this, how to live well, how to be successful. No. Jesus said very clearly, um, many times, he talked about his own deity. He talked about that he is the only way. That is a big thing to say. He didn't say, I am one of the ways. He said, I am the only way. Either what he said is true or what he said is a lie. No in between. Right. So then, what does the Bible say about the deity of Christ? What does the Bible say about the absolute uniqueness of Christ? Even the Bible itself says he is God and is absolutely unique. Then, number four, his incarnation and virgin birth. Nobody else like that. Nobody else claims. Uh, this is God who became man, was born of a virgin. Number five, his life, work, teaching, and impact on history. I mean, today you say, he lived such a simple life 2,000 years ago, and he has impacted every nation. He never wrote a book, he never started anything, he never formed an organization, nothing. But today, there are more churches, more buildings, more songs more people, everything, all over the world, following Jesus. His sacrificial death, that in his death, he, he died for sin. So nobody else says, I die, I'm dying for the sins of the world. Yeah, that's very unique. His resurrection. So no other religion or faith is based on the resurrection of the person. That person rose. So others they died, the memorial is here, they died there, the grave is there, whatever. But in for the Christian faith, sorry, Jesus is not here. He's risen. Right? There is no come to this place, this is where he was buried. No. And uh, how salvation is offered through faith in Christ, and number nine how he transforms lives. So these are nine things we can put forward and say, hey, look at these nine things. You think about it. This is what makes Jesus very unique. And we can explain. Now, it's good to know these nine things. And then when you're having a conversation with somebody, you say a few. I don't. If you have time to say all nine, it's OK. But you share you know, what is really important for them. right? So let's um, get started with this. We'll continue this next week. Number one, what did Jesus claim for himself? Right. Look at all these things. He said, I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. You know, uh, Before Abraham was, I am. I was there before Abraham. So people got angry with him. How can you? are only 30 years old. How can you say before Abraham you were there? So I'm the door, I'm the good shepherd, I'm the resurrection, the life, I'm the way, the truth, the life, I'm the true wine. And we can, you know, look at all these things. So this is what Jesus, I am this. Yeah. Who, are, who else stood up and said like this? I mean, it, it, either you're gone or you're true. To stand up and say, I am the truth. He claimed to be the only way to the Father. He said, I am the way, the truth, the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Very clear. He didn't say, I am one of the ways. Some of you can come to the Father through me. Some of you can come through Moses. Some of you can come through David. You cannot go to the Father except through very clear. Either that statement is true or it is false. 
He even claimed pre-existence. So this is what we saw, John 8, 56 to 59. Uh, he's saying, you know, Abraham saw my day, he was happy. He said, uh, he was saying, well, you've seen Abraham? How do you know he was happy when he saw your day? Obviously he's talking about how, as eternal God, he watched Abraham. And he says, before Abraham was, I am. And this is why they wanted to kill him. Because he's claiming to be God. Before Abraham was, I am. Right? And when he was praying to the Father, his prayer is very clear. John 17, 5. Father, glorify me with the glory which I had with you before the world was. That means he's saying, I was with you even before the world began. Is claiming pre-existence. So, so, uh, and he claimed to be one with the Father. John five twenty six. The Father has he has life in himself. He has given me power to have life in myself. That means I'm self-existent. John ten thirty. I and my Father are one. And the Jews took up stones to stone him because he said, "You are making yourself God." Being a man, you're making yourself God. So the Jews understood it. When he said, I and the Father are one, he's making himself God. So, uh, and he also claimed power over death. He said, I'm laying my life down, I will take it up again. So who can say that tomorrow I'm dying, I'll see you day after tomorrow. Who can say that? He said, I'm, I'm going to be crucified. But I'll rise up. I'll lay my life down. I will take it up again. Who can say that? Jesus said it. Right? So, either these are the statements of somebody who's lost their mind, or statements that are true. Have to either say this way or that way. No in between. And... Uh, he indeed rose up from the dead, and he claimed uh, he claimed to be alive after his uh, crucifixion. He said, "I was dead. I'm alive. I'm Alpha and Omega." Right. So, the, the, we'll stop here. But the first point is this: there is nobody else who has made such kind of claims. There are lots of good religious leaders. People who have come, they have spoken, given lots of lectures, all kinds of things they have done. But did they claim like this? Did they make such claims? Nobody. You know. And in Jesus' time, he not only said, I will die and rise again. We will see in our next lesson, he did rise up again. People saw him alive. You know? And we are experiencing the risen Christ in our lives. So that's the first thing we put forward. Is there anyone else who has made these claims? And his claims were very clear and they were very unique. All right. Let's stop here. We'll uh, continue this next week. Um, let me see here. There's a question. Um, Lucy's question is. In our family Bible studies, one of the members spoke about Job. He said, as God gave permission to Satan to test Job, likewise God allowed Adam and Eve also to be tempted by Satan. Yeah, that is true. Like all of us today, we are all being tempted by the devil, by Satan and his demons, all of us. So, uh, you know, God has given Satan and his demons to tempt all of us or to come against all of us. So as long as God has allowed Satan to be on this earth, it's the same thing, the same way he had went against Job or he tempted Adam and Eve. He's coming against you and me today. So no difference, right? Uh, it's it's going on, and it will all come to an end uh, when Jesus returns and sets up His kingdom in Revelation twenty, verse one to four. Right? Pastor, was it allowed on uh, Adam and Eve specifically? Sorry, like uh, he gave, ha, was it allowed uh, on Adam and Eve specifically? Has he gave permission to 
uh, Satan on Job. Yeah. So what we know is from the time, you know, from God put Adam and Eve in the garden, he told Adam and Eve, Genesis 2.15, you know, I told Adam, I want you to tend the garden and I want you to guard the garden. Keep it. Keep it means to guard it, to be like a watchman. So obviously God was saying, Adam, be careful. You have to protect this place. Uh, implying that the enemy would, would seek to come. So God warned him. Now, we, there is no record that God, you know, that, that there was any conversation between Satan and God and Satan asking permission. Uh, there's no record of that. But it seems like Satan came in and tempted the devil. Uh, Satan came in and tempted Adam. Uh, there's no conversation of having a per per permission. The same way you and I, like, I don't, uh, you know, it's not like every time you and I are tempted, the devil goes and gets permission and comes. No. He's here. This world is, has been handed to him since Adam's fall. Uh, like how when, when he tempted Jesus, he said, all of this has been given to me. So Sid, since Adam's disobedience, Satan is the god of this world. So he tempts, he carries out his wicked schemes on the earth against all people. Now, in Job's case, we have a conversation, a record of a conversation between God and Satan about Job. And Job says, you know, uh, and God, God is like bragging about Job. You know, haven't you seen my servant Job? And but then Satan counters that, saying, "Oh no, he's believing in you just because you're protecting him, keeping him." And uh, and God says, "Okay, go ahead. You know, you do this." Now, in our case also, we are protected by God, but that doesn't mean Satan cannot attack us or cannot tempt us. Neither does it mean that every time he has to go get permission from God to attack us. No. We are actually living in a world that is right now being given to Satan. So he has full free course on the earth. God is protecting us. He has told us you know, how to protect ourselves with his word. Uh, but Satan can tempt and attack us any time. Um, I'm not sure if I really answered your question, but um, the point I'm saying is, the point I want to get at is, um, Satan doesn't need permission. He didn't need permission to attack Job. Neither, neither does he need permission to attack any believer because uh, the Bible says Satan is the god of this world. The whole world is un in the lap of the evil one. But uh, we can guard ourselves. We can protect ourselves uh, from what the enemy says. You know, One scripture reference, 1 John 5, 18 and 19. Whoever is born of God keeps himself and that wicked one cannot touch him. But verse 19 says, and we know that the whole world lies in the lap or in, in the hand of the wicked one. First John 5, 18 and 19. Okay, okay. Uh, we can, this, we can oh, yes. go ahead. Yes. Yes. My, my uh, response was like that. He, God had given the free will to Adam and Eve in the, Eden, in the Garden of Eden. Yes. But uh, uh, the Satan sought an... Uh, but uh, means a particular time, and he it made an attempt on uh, Adam and Eve to come out of God's uh, uh, fence. Like yes, yes. Is that was that is that right, Pastor? Yes, yes. He made an attempt. That's right. At that time, he was not God of this world. Adam was in charge, so he tried. He was came as an intruder. He made an attempt, but Adam fell for it. Yeah. So the. Uh, Means when we don't have any written scriptures that God, uh, God gave, um, means permission for uh, Satan to tempt Adam and Eve. So we can't speak uh, such type of uh, things about it, like about the temptation. Um, so yeah, there is no scripture that Satan sought permission. So I, I didn't, I didn't hear your last part clearly. Uh, I mean to say that when we don't have any written scriptures. As uh, God gave permission to Satan on Job, and uh, we don't have uh, means uh, that support Adam and Eve's temptation. Mm -hmm. That's right. That's right. We don't have the same scriptures. 
so we means we cannot comment like that that uh, god gave permission or uh, permission to satan permission to satan to tempt adam and eve correct correct we cannot make that statement yeah okay okay thank you everyone we'll continue this next week thank you thank pastor you. thank you thank you bye now pastor just one quick question